Welcome to the Progressive Primitivist Podcast, where we believe that the only way to go forward in religion is to go back to the Bible. What exactly is restorationism or primitivism? Well, we have a series of three lessons presented by Ed Harrell where he examines the undergirding assumptions of primitivism. We think that you'll really enjoy those lessons. Ed Harrell is probably my favorite preacher. He was a very educated man. He got a PhD in history from Vanderbilt University. And for over 50 years, he taught in American uh, secular universities, American religious history, and was one of the most respected American religious historians. He wrote the definitive biography on Oral Roberts and also the definitive biography on Pat Robertson. He was well known for uh, his uh, work among Pentecostals and documenting Pentecostal history. He wrote a textbook uh, on early uh, Pentecostal revivalists called All Things Are Possible. And he did write three books on the history of the Stone Campbell Restoration Movement. Uh, Brother Harold died uh, earlier this year. We think that you'll really enjoy these lessons from him. Well, okay, so we're finally going to get to it tonight, as Jeff says. And that is to end up this this study of what is it that we are trying to do? What does it mean to be a primitive Christian? And is that where you need to be? You see, as I look out and see this fine audience here in this good church, uh, every generation does its own thinking and every generation makes its own decisions. And as time goes by, People change, churches change, and the only way that they can remain what they ought to be is if we are committed to the plea of going back and just being primitive New Testament Christians. And that involves being a congregation that looks like New Testament congregations. And so what we've done is study these three principles that we are all committed to who are trying to just be primitive New Testament Christians. Number one, to the principle of apostolic authority, to believing that the writings of the apostles as they were collected in the first century were given for our direction, that the scriptures teach us that they were God's uh, men intended to reveal, given the authority to reveal, and credentials to reveal his will. And that we, with our common sense, can go and read those instructions and understand what they say. That we do that all the time in life. That God has given all of us the ability to read the scriptures and see what they say and to go do them. And tonight I want to talk with you about how that has ended up in the thinking of people who said we want to just be New Testament Christians in the establishing of congregations that we intend to look like New Testament congregations. And so the principle of coming together and collecting ourselves together according to apostolic authority and the principles that we read there, is an important one in the understanding of New Testament Christianity. Now, there are a lot of principles that we need to understand about how we become New Testament Christians. It's not all about just a church. A lot of people will say, well, I don't think the church is so important. I mean, what's important is just, is just the gospel and uh, the grace of God in saving us. There are many things that are important. But if you read the New Testament, you will read that it ends up with people gathering themselves together in congregations. There's a great passage in the 14th chapter of Acts, beginning in verse 21, that describes the Apostle Paul and Barnabas coming back through the cities where they had taught for about two years 
And it kind of lays out for us how they went about establishing primitive New Testament Christianity. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, I'll tell you how primitive New Testament Christianity begins. It begins with just the preaching of the gospel. That's why we started talking about apostolic authority. If you want to be primitive Christians, New Testament Christians, that comes from the preaching of the gospel of Christ. That's why I have tried all through my years of preaching to just simply preach biblical text. I think my favorite compliment that I ever got about my preaching was I saw Farrell Jenkins many years ago after I'd held a meeting in St. Louis where Farrell had just preached and left. And he said, I got a letter from a friend of mine up in St. Louis. And he said, we had a fellow for a meeting up here and said, he was really a good preacher, said it was a good meeting. He said, you know, he's a highly educated man, but you sure couldn't tell it from his preaching. <laughs> and I always kind of liked that, that you just preach the simple gospel. When I taught at the University of Arkansas, there was a uh, there was a sister in that congregation who was a wonderful woman, a little bit scatterbrained, but she, she confirmed that opinion. She said to my wife one time, she said, I'd just love to hear your husband preach. He's so simple-minded. And, uh, and uh, I thought, well, that's all right. There's a place to be simple-minded. And the simple-minded is in having a commitment to apostolic authority and the scriptures and the revelation that's there. And so that is where primitive Christianity begins. It begins with a confidence that we have in God's word. And all of us just need to reinforce in our own minds over and over again that that is what we're committed to, is just the preaching of the gospel. And that that will accomplish what God intends to accomplish. And when they had preached the gospel in that city and had made many disciples, I did, there's a second kind of fundamental principle that we have to understand, and that is that all we're trying to do is make people disciples of Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to convert people to my group. I'm not trying to start a denomination or a sect. I don't, I don't have any agenda other than saying, if you're not a Christian, if you're here tonight and you never have obeyed the gospel of Christ, what you need to do is come be a learner and follower of Jesus Christ. And that's all we call people to. And they, then they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that through many tribulations, we must enter into the kingdom of God. Now, if we had time to preach this whole sermon tonight, I will tell you, that's a powerful thing. That what we are called to, you young folks, what you're called to is not to be served, but to serve. And I can tell you that, I, I've preached a lot of sermons in my life, telling people all the good things that will happen to them if they're a Christian. And there are a lot of good things that happen to you if you're a Christian. It'll keep you out of jail and keep you out of trouble and it'll help you be good parents and it'll give you good marriages and you can have good families. And we just get many things out of being a, a primitive New Testament Christian, but that, that's not what we become when we become Christians. We become servants. And if you go to heaven, you'll go through much tribulation. And if you have done, if there's some things that are hard for you to do, I preached that in California a few years back, and a lady came up to me one night, and she had a little boy, about five or six-year-old little boy. She said, I want to tell you what my little boy said. I was doing a week meeting on Monday night. She said, uh, I told him to go get ready to go to church tonight. And he said, what do you mean, church? 
And she said, well, Brother Harold's here. He said, we're having a meeting. We're going to go to church tonight. And he said, look, this ain't Sunday, and this ain't Wednesday night, and I ain't going to church. I mean, going to church on Monday night, now that's hard. But what I want to tell you is there are people who've done harder things than that. There are people who suffered and died and been in hard places. So you need to get ready for service. But someone might say, well, yeah, boy, that's right. What we need to do is just preach the gospel and just call people to come be disciples of Christ. And we're, we're, not, we're not concerned about all this church business, but what we need to do is just commit ourselves to Jesus. Well, you do need to do that. That's exactly what being a primitive Christian is about, and a lot of it is just about you. But I will tell you where it all ends up in verse 23. And when they had appointed them elders in every church. I preach a sermon sometime called After Baptism. And I'll tell you what happens after baptism. After baptism in the New Testament come churches. And they gathered themselves together in elders, uh, in congregations. They ordered themselves. And so it is that you can't study about being a primitive New Testament Christian without studying about being primitive New Testament churches. And that's a principle that's been understood for a long time. So we do finally come this evening to this question of what did a primitive New Testament church look like if that's what we intend to be today and I believe that's the principle that all of us need to be committed to and conscious of why it is that we're doing it it is because when we read about people be, becoming Christians in New Testament days they became a part of bodies of people congregations of people gathered together according to a certain order. And I've been showing you my list here from time to time. I'm going to go through my list with you in just a minute. But let's, let's first go through just a few passages about, well, is this really something that matters? Did it matter exactly what those churches did? And what I want to suggest to you is just in so many different ways in the New Testament, we are told that that is a good question. I preached on Saturday evening about what obeying God was about, was asking the right questions, asking good questions, and then going to the Scriptures to find the answer. Well, is it a good question to say, what did New Testament churches do? And what did they look like? The... Scriptures teach us that New Testament congregations were ordered by apostolic authority. You know, there are two passages that are really pertinent to that idea, both of which are passages that come at the end of the Apostle Paul's instructions to Timothy and Titus about the appointing of elders in local congregations. And so in that familiar passage in 1 Timothy, the third chapter, in verses 14 and 15, he writes these things right unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Now what he done is he had told them how to organize one of those congregations. And he said that I tell you to do this because you need to understand how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God which is the church of the living God. Or, as he wrote to Titus, when he was instructing Titus on the same subject, he says in Titus 1 and verse 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. So what we read about New Testament congregations being was not something that was casual, wasn't something that just happened, it wasn't just arbitrary instructions that were given to one congregation, but it was the intentional instruction of the apostles. Now, in the book of 1 Corinthians, there are about nine passages in the book of 1 Corinthians 
that say the same thing, that the Apostle Paul says, I'm sending you instructions about what the congregation ought to do. And these are not instructions that are just uh, peculiar to you, but they are the instructions that I order in all the churches. 1 Timothy 4, 17, For this cause have I sent unto you, Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So he says, what I instruct one church to do, I instruct all churches to do. So if you read about one church doing something in the New Testament, what you can rest assured is that by apostolic authority, all of them were taught to do the same thing. 1 Corinthians 7, 17, But as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord has called everyone, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. 1 Corinthians 16, 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. And so repeatedly in the New Testament, we are told that when the apostles gave instructions to a church, that the apostle Paul said, I give the same instructions to everybody. And so when we read about a church doing something and being something in New Testament days, we can rest assured that all of the churches did that. Now, sometimes someone will say, well, you know, I just don't believe we ought to put all this emphasis on the church anyhow. Well, you need to read the book of Ephesians tonight because if you read the book of Ephesians, you will read a grand description of what the church was. It is the body of Christ. God has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is the fullness of his body, uh, which is the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, that, that, of course, is a description of the grand and universal church. But in the book of Ephesians, we can't, you can't read the book without understanding that the church was not only intentional, it appears everywhere that the gospel is preached and people are converted, but it is indeed that great body of Christians that God intends to set aside and save. Well, I'm not going to show you much of these slides. I'm just going to click through some historical sides, slides. Sorry I couldn't do more history with you because it's interesting. But I'll just show you a few slides to tell you that people have understood that all through the years. When people come along and say, oh, well, I don't really think the church makes much difference or that we're bound somehow to just do certain things in the church, actually Christians have always assumed that that was the case that we ought to be bound in our worship together in congregations by the rule of doing what the apostles said. This is the Apostles' Creed, which is maybe the earliest post-biblical Christian document that we have. And what it did was call for a holy Catholic church and communion of the saints. Now, that's that's an interesting statement because there is no Roman Catholic Church at that point. But what it affirms is that God's intent was to establish a uniform, universal church. And that Christians have never presumed, serious Christians have never presumed, that every church could just do whatever it wanted to do. But rather that churches should be bound by the Word of God. I've written a textbook that made this point it's so firmly in American history. When you read about the early Puritans that came to this country, I, I will tell you what they did. They understood this principle. They would bind themselves together in congregations and they'd draw up covenants. This is a covenant that was drawn up by the Salem Church in 1629. We covenant with the Lord and with one another and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in all His ways according as He is pleased to reveal Himself unto us in His blessed word of truth. They said, well, what we are is we are a group of people. That's what this group is. It is a group of people who are joined together agreeing that we want to walk in His ways in everything that we do. That's another 
covenant, the Watertown covenant. It, it's a good one. It says we bind ourselves together, together to renounce all idolatry and superstition and to observe and keep all of his statutes, commands, and ordinances in matters concerning our reformation, his worship, and so on. Well, sorry, I don't have time to talk with you about these documents. It is interesting, by the way, that those old Puritan churches, if you've ever been up there, this was uh, from their covenant, ecclesiastical polity of the ch or church government, is nothing else but that form and order that is to be observed in the church of Christ upon earth. By the way, they call themselves the church of Christ and said that what we need to do is we need to bind ourselves together, and when we come together, just do the thing that we can read in the Scriptures. And that is what Thomas and Alexander Campbell said as well. Now, let's get to our chart. What did New Testament churches of Christ look like? What can we learn about that? I'm not going to read these passages, but here, here's my list. Now, this is not all the passages, but it's all the things that I can think of. And before I show you my list, let me just tell you this. Um, I'm not wedded to my list. I'm just wedded to the principle of finding out what ought to be on the list. And when I get done with my list, you may say, well, now I know something that ought to be on your list that's not on your list. Well, if you do, that'll be just fine. You just... Tell me tonight, and it's easy with PowerPoint. I can just put it right in there, and uh, I'll put it in there. Or if you say, well, you got, you got stuff on your list that I don't think ought to be on your list. Well, that would be good. If you'll tell me that, I'll be glad to take it out. It's easy to erase it. But this is what I know. When I read through the New Testament, if you want to know what God teaches about any subject, the only way I know to do it is to read the Scriptures. And every time you read something about it, you write that down. When you get done, you add it up. What I know is they were a group of people organized together with elders and deacons. You can look at these scriptures later yourself. I'm not going to take the time to read them. But in Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, we know that the church in Philippi had bishops and deacons. And in Acts 14 and 23, that elders were ordained in every church. 1 Timothy 3, we're given instructions about how elders were to be appointed. A second thing I know about churches in New Testament days is that they assembled together. They were instructed not to forsake the assembling of themselves together. In Hebrews 10, 25, 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, gives them lots of uh, instructions about what to do when they assembled together. I know a number of things they did when they assembled together. They taught. In Acts 20 and 7, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them. 1 Corinthians 14 tells us about the process of teaching and instruction that went on when local churches came together. They prayed. In Acts 12 and 5, prayer was made of the church for Peter when he was in prison. 1 Corinthians 14 15, that people are instructed, Christians were instructed to pray with uh, to pray with the understanding also. They sang. I know that on the basis of about five or six scriptures in the New Testament. For instance, Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16, we can read the instructions of the Christians to sing together. They took the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. I know that because in First Corinthians, I mean in Acts the 20th chapter and verse 7, we can read that the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread. By the way, the post-biblical <clears throat> um, literature is just quite clear on this question as well. And that is that early Christians uniformly gathered together on the first day of the week for the breaking of bread, the taking of the Lord's Supper. They gave on the first day of the week. In 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. That is, all of you do it the same way. Let it, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered. They had a treasury. We can read about that in Acts 5th chapter, verses 1 through 4. 
That is, they had a collection of money that was laid at the apostles' feet and became the congregation, congregational money. I know some things they did with that money. For instance, I know there are nine passages in the New Testament that tell about the use of that money for the relief of needy saints. And you can, you can read those passages. They're all quite clear and explicit. They supported preachers with those funds. In 2 Corinthians 11, chapter and verse 8, the Apostle Paul said, I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. And finally, on occasion, they met together, they came together and disciplined unruly members. We can read about that in 1 Corinthians 5 and verses 1 through 5. So, there it is. That's my list. And somebody might say, well, there's a lot of things not on your list. That is true. Actually, almost everything's not on my list. Actually, the only thing that's on my list is just what's on my list. But if you want, if you want a scriptural answer to the question of what do I know about what local churches looked like in New Testament days, that's what I know about what they looked like. And the question of what we know about it explains what we do and what we do not do. What I do when I come together in a church is I do the same things that I can read about churches doing in New Testament days. And that not only tells me what I do, but it tells me what I don't do. I don't do anything else. Now, now that's a simple explanation. You young folks, you need to nail that down. It's not a complicated question. It's a simple question. If you say, what should we do if we want to be a New Testament primitivist congregation, you should do the same things they do. And that explains the behavior that we uh, go through when we come together. It explains how it is that we organize, organize ourselves together. And it eliminates everything else. Now, I could, I could take each one of these points and illustrate how it is that, that that tells us what it is that we ought to do. For instance, in terms of what kind of what kind of music did New Testament congregations have? Well, if we want to be primitive Christians, what kind of music would you have? Well, what I can read, I can read where they sang. And there are just about five passages, actually, that we can look at that said they sang. But someone might say, well, that, that seems like a pretty petty thing. Is it, is it really that important? as to whether you sing with instruments of music or whether you sing without instruments of music. I mean, there's some grand themes in the Scriptures that we ought to be talking about, and is this kind of nitpicking, is that really important that you just have to do exactly that? Should we divide churches just because of instrumental music? It seems pretty minor to me, actually, as to why, why in the world you would be so concerned about an issue like that. But, although, I want to tell you that that's not such a curious issue after all. For instance, the Catholic Encyclopedia says that the first Christians were too spiritual a fiber to substitute lifeless instruments or to use them to accompany the human voice. Said, well, the early Christians thought it was important. At the Greek Orthodox Church, which, by the way, did not use instrumental music until the 1940s, said the execution of the, of the Byzantine church music by instruments or even the accompaniment of sacred chanting by instruments was ruled out by the Eastern Fathers as being incompatible 
with pure, solemn, spiritual character of religion, of the religion of Christ. John Calvin said, the father of Presbyterianism, musical instruments in celebrating the praises of God would be no, no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting up of lamps, the restoration of other shadows of the law. The papists, therefore, have foolishly borrowed this, as well as many other things, from the Jews. Men who are fond of outward pomp may delight in that noise, but the simplicity which God recommends to us by the apostles is far more pleasing to him. That's interesting. Seems unimportant, but John Calvin thought it was important. Or John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, said, I have no objection to instruments of music in our chapels, provided they're neither heard nor seen. Or Adam Clark, the great Methodist commentator, said, Music is a science I esteem and admire, but instruments of music in the house of God I abominate and abhor. This is the abuse of music. And here I register my protest against all such corruptions in the worship of the author of Christianity. Or the great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon said, I would as soon attempt to pray with machinery as to sing to him with machinery. So now, if somebody tells you, oh, well, that's curious that you would be concerned about a little question like that, all I would tell you is you, you wouldn't be the first one that was curious then. That many people who believed that we ought to be going back and behaving ourselves like primitive Christians behaved ourselves. Many historical figures through the years have agreed that that was important. But what I want to tell you, and what, what I hope you young folks can grasp, is that the idea of being in the concept of being a primitive New Testament Christian, what is important is not each one of these particular questions that sometimes someone might say, well, that really seems small and divisive and insignificant to me. I'll tell you what's important. That's important. It's important to say, I am committed to the apostolic tradition. That I want to be a primitive Christian and I want us to behave ourselves according to the apostolic directions that we can read about in the New Testament. And someone may go down this list and say, oh, well, I don't really see how that's so important. Well, I'll tell you why it's important. It's important because we're trying to just do what God's Word instructs us to do. And that is the critical issue. And I want to tell you that what this congregation wants to do and aspires to be is a primitive New Testament church that looks just like churches did in New Testament days. And... In that regard, everything that we learn about what New Testament Christians did is an important issue for us. Well, that's the primitive message. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability that God giveth, that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, young folks, where we started out in this is that every generation thinks for themselves. And that's fine. That is absolutely as it should be. You, know, you should not do something just because your parents did it or because somebody you like did it. You need to do it because you believe it's the thing that you ought to be doing. And sometimes where that uh, comes down is, well, you know, that's just what's always been done, and we just have followed these traditions. And, and I think what we need to do is we need to think outside the box and look around and see what else is available out there. So I will just give you my 80-year-old experience 
of looking in the boxes. I taught, I've taught American religious history and I've taught comparative religious history in universities for many years. And I have looked in a lot of boxes with a lot of different ideas of how you ought to be behaving yourself. And what I want to tell you is that there is no box out there that is better than to say, I just want to go back and follow apostolic authority and do only what I can find in the scriptures. That'll save you a lot of trouble in life. I've been in lots of circumstances in which people thought that where I was was a ridiculous place to be, but if all you have to say is, well, what I believe in doing is just what I can find the New Testament church doing. It's a great and easy defense. And it is what God calls us to do, and it's what God calls us to be. And every little issue is important because it is joined to the big issue of saying I'm committed to simply being a New Testament Christian. Well, I hope you'll be there when you get to be my age. I've uh, had a long trip committed to that simple principle. It's an easy principle to explain, easy to adhere to, and it is clearly what the scriptures call us to do. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian and you would come and obey the gospel of Christ, what you need to do is just read the scriptures in exactly the same way. See what they say and see what people were directed to do. And then come and do that. And what it'll do is it'll make you a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you can associate yourself together with people who are bound to this idea of going back to the primitive New Testament patterns following them without fail. If you're here, would come tonight, confess your faith in Jesus, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, or if you're in any way subject to the invitation, we invite you to come. While we stay. Again, thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, if you like our content, if you want to see more videos like this, make sure you leave a thumbs up on our video and you comment uh, what you thought in the comment section. But also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you can see uh, our content and whenever we post content. And make sure you follow us on our social medias in the description below. Uh, thank you again. See you next time.